We'll jump back into 1 Corinthians next week. There's plenty of meat left on that bone. But this week, I wanted to help us think Christianly and biblically about our approach to a new year. Now, you may have many resolutions, goals, or priorities for the year, and I'm sure they are all helpful. Maybe you want to be healthier. Maybe you want to read your Bible more. Maybe you want to save some money. Maybe you want to lower your screen time or pick up a new hobby. Maybe you have big life events on the horizon and you hope to handle those well. Now, most of those things are all quite good. If you're looking for a cynical take this morning, you won't find one here. If it's helpful for you to set those sorts of goals, set away. Let me encourage you, simply wanting good things to happen almost always precedes any good thing happening. So even if you have some resolutions that don't make it to week two, at least you're still resolving. Wanting good things to happen, of course, does not guarantee that they will, but wanting good things to happen is a gracious first step in that direction. For our desires are significant. If you want to grow in grace, live a life marked by humility, love, joy, and holiness, then that desire itself is a gracious gift of God. This morning, I don't really have uh, resolutions or specific goals to come into you, like here are three resolutions for our church in 2024. No, I wanna do something uh, just a bit different. I wanna provide from the scriptures some general perspective, direction, and counsel. And I hope this general truth from God's word can then be used to inform the specifics of your 2024, your family's 2024, and our church's 2024 as we follow Christ together. While all of our lives and callings are in one sense unique, they're also aimed in the same direction. It is that general direction, that shared aim which grabs our focus This morning. So, really, I just want to say three things from Philippians chapter three. First, I want to encourage you to leave the past behind. I want to give you that perspective to leave the past behind. Second, I want to invite you to strain upward and forward. Strain upward and forward. Push ahead in your spiritual life. This straining gives sort of the the, the direction for our lives. It gives us the, the aim, a sort of guiding principle, a true north for all of our ventures. And third, perhaps most importantly, I want to just encourage you and remind you to hold on to the gospel. This is sort of like a counsel for how you'll make it, how you'll keep straining, how you'll let the past stay in the past. Philippians 3, I'm going to read verses 12 through 21 and then just jump right into it. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of Philippi, now not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul's testimony is that of a man in the process of becoming who Christ has made him. The apostle has not yet attained perfection, nor has he attained the resurrection of the dead. He hasn't made it yet, so to speak. I like the NIV's translation here. Not that I have already obtained all this or haven't already arrived at my goal. He speaks not as one who has made all things his own, but as one who Christ has made his own. This may be helpful for you this morning. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, 
if you're maybe a, a new Christian, you, you're just believing, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and at different seasons of your life you've been more engaged than others and you're just trying to make sense of, of where to go from here. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you have room to grow. If the Apostle Paul, author of much of the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, can say, I haven't reached my goal yet. I haven't made this all my own. I'm not done. I've not, I'm not perfect. I've not attained the ultimate prize. Then surely we too have room to grow. Like I am not sinless. I am not perfect. I don't know it all. I, I haven't made it. But wherever you are in your journey, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the decisive change. Not necessarily your actions or your decisions, but, but what Christ has done. That's what really makes the difference here. Wherever you are in your journey, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. This changes everything. So before you resolve to do anything, as you look at all the things you'd like to change or adjust in your life, rest. The Lord Jesus Christ has sought you and bought you with his redeeming blood. He loved you before you knew him. He loved you before you were born, and he will love you through the end. He had the first word in your spiritual life, and he will have the last word. Because Christ Jesus has made you his own, you are free to move forward with him by faith and leave the past in the past. Remember, Paul was a religious man, but not a good man. He kept the law, but he sent Christians to their death. He let both his religious acumen and grievous sins die with his old self because Jesus changes everything. Whatever your specific goals and plans for 2024, let me invite you to simply let a new year be a new year. Let a second chance wrought by the presence of the Spirit in your life who you have because Christ has made you his own, let the grace of God do what the grace of God does. You are not doomed to do what you've always done. You are not destined to be what you have always been. Because you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, he has sent the Holy Spirit to be your helper and guide you in all truth and righteousness. There is no room for cynicism here this morning. Change is therefore possible. You have hope. You can be the sort of Christian you never thought you could be. You can be hopeful in whatever darkness lies ahead. You can persevere amidst great difficulties that lie ahead. You can rejoice when things may be profoundly challenging. Why? Not because you have a good attitude, not because the calendar has gone from one year to the next, but because Jesus Christ has made you his own. This is not sentimentality. This is our spiritual reality. So my first invitation to you as you stand here on the precipice of a new year is to let the past be the past. Let the weight you've gained instead of lost be in the past. Let the Bible reading plans you've let die in Leviticus. Come on. We've all done it. Okay. Let it be in the past. Let the aspirations that you've had and not fulfilled and just feel like, why do I even go through these motions every year? Well, because the ever-present spirit can change us at any moment. Let the past be the past. Maybe you have a dark past. Or maybe you are quite proud of your past. Good news or bad news, it's gone. You can't obey God yesterday. You can't obey him tomorrow either. You can plan to, sure, but you can only obey him right now. My first charge for you, for us, is to simply forget what lies behind you. Learn from that which has happened, but do not center your life around the things that have happened. Do not let the past be the lens through which you view the present or the future. Replace that lens with a different one the Lord Jesus Christ for you. Simply remember that Jesus Christ has made you his own, and this is the decisive change in your life. This is the thing that makes all the difference. Center your life then on him. So, 
Let the past, its triumphs and its failures, its struggles, its disappointments, its joys and its successes, let it simply stay in the past. Instead, strain forward for the upward call of God. The second invitation, strain for the upward call of God. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Here is the perspective, Paul says, of a mature saint. I know I'm not all that, but I press on to the goal for the upward prize of God in Christ Jesus. So the goal of spiritual progress is maturity, to grow up together into Christ. And this, Paul says, is the mindset of a mature Christian, that we are humble and reliant on the grace of God, enjoying the love of God and moving forward towards the promises of God by faith in God. If that's not your perspective, Paul says, pray about it until it becomes your perspective. (laughs) If that's not your perspective, God will reveal it to you at some point later. And he might reveal it to you in profoundly painful ways. This is one of those overarching resolutions, one of those passages that speak to the guiding aspirations for our whole lives. We press on, we strain ahead for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And as I said, we do these things. The Christian life is a corporate venture. In verse 17, Paul says to watch him and watch others who are living this way. Look for examples and be an example of what it looks like to push ahead, to strain forward for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, sadly, Paul says, you've got to be discerning because there are some examples that you think should be good examples but are bad examples. There are people who are on the street corners of the first century and on the social media feeds of the 21st century who are offering you an example for how to live that are not offering a healthy, good, godly, biblical, loving, Christ-exalting example of how to live. So Paul is saying, be very careful. Look to me, as an apostle, Paul says this, and look to others who have this mindset and then learn from them how to strain forward, how to push ahead for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I don't tell you this like um, glibly or with any glee or any sort of happiness. Like I tell you through tears that there are many who are providing you an example that leads a different way. They are thinking in earthy ways. Their God is their belly. That means they're just people of the flesh and their end is destruction. Don't take that path. They walk as enemies as the cross of Christ. Their mind is on earthly things. Their end is destruction. Avoid these people. Love them, but avoid them. Don't take cues from them. Don't let them be an example for you. They're on a different path, living for different goals, and that path ends in destruction. Set your mind, Paul says, not on earthly things, but on heavenly things. He reminds the Philippians, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. That, friends, is worth it. That's the goal. That's where we're headed. So we strain ahead to get there. A clear and compelling vision of the destination helps us embrace the difficulty of the journey. A clear and compelling vision of our destination helps us embrace the difficulty of our journey. Whenever you're coming up I-77 on those traffic-filled summer vacation travel weekends, when you are, I don't know if you've ever been here, in the log jam of that 77-81 split, when you hit the traffic at the tunnel and you think you're gonna die in Virginia, you, God help you, you have to have a clear vision of almost heaven, West Virginia, that beckons you to keep going, to persevere through those jam-packed gas stations with restroom lines that remind you of the very gates of hell. You have to persevere through the waits and the wrong orders at the McDonald's and the Wendy's and all the restaurants you have to hit 
in Withville. You have to persevere up the highway to get home to the place you belong, West Virginia Mountain Mama. When you are in school and you despise your math homework, your trigonometry homework, like you have to remember that graduation is the goal and it's worth it. In the frustrating moments where, when am I gonna use this? Well, you're gonna use this right now to graduate. Some days our spiritual journey is as challenging as trigonometry and as frustrating as a traffic jam. On those days, you have to remember that Jesus is worth it. You will behold him in glory and you will reflect that glory back to him. Grace will flower into glory and you will step into eternity. You will see the Lord your God and dwell forever in the land of the living. You know, I think uh, it's good and right to think of all the ways that Christianity imminently affects us. Here's what that means. Uh, it's important to think about how our faith uh, impacts our lives, how it looks, how it sounds, acts, and smells. It's important. We need to think about these things in sermons and in books and in all forms of uh, instruction. Like we need, to, we need to really and carefully consider the imminent implications, the immediate things we can see, touch, taste, hear, et cetera, of our faith. Good preaching certainly addresses those things. But we cannot lose the transcendence of the Christian gospel. Our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, Paul says. Our goal is not simply to live a good and moral life. Our prize is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the transcendent and beautiful truth of the Christian faith. You will see God. That's our aim, that's where we're going, that's, our, that's where we're striving for. Let those of you who are mature, Paul says, think this way. Leave the past behind and push ahead for the prize to behold the glory of God in a resurrected body. Now, to press on and to strain is to actively advance in the spiritual life in pursuit of the Lord. Let me just tell you this. You know this through experience, but let me remind us all. This is not automatic. You will not just drift towards holiness this year. You will not just easily forgive others. You will not haphazardly grow in prayer. You will not just magically stop lusting after others or stop viewing pornography. You will not just stumble into regular church attendance. You will not accidentally become generous with your money and time. You will not find time in your schedule to invest in others. Like none of these things are just going to happen. But you can choose these things. In 2024, you can do things that are helpful and not hurtful, even if it's a little difficult on the front end. You might have to strain. You might have to push through discomfort. But it's worth it. So make sure your plans and resolutions, whatever they may be, rise from this mindset, this mature mindset, and serve this goal. We live for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, how? Well, I'm glad you asked. Hold on to the gospel. So let the past be what it is. Maybe you had a great year, maybe it was the worst year of your life. Maybe you look back on years of serving as a deacon, a church member, a Sunday school teacher, a worship leader, a kids teacher, or whatever it might be. You look back on years of that, or maybe you look back on years of revelry and no church attendance and nothing about God in your life. Wherever you are, like learn the lessons, whatever, but like let's not, that's not who, that's who you were. Let's, let's be who we are. Let's be who Christ is making us. Like, let's look to the back and let's strain forward for what lies ahead. Let's push ahead. Let's choose good things even when it's difficult. Let's keep that transcendent vision of our goal. 
of the glory of God in our sights. Like, let's keep that goal ever before us and let's strain forward to get there. But the only way we're going to get there is by holding on to what we've already attained. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Forget what lies behind, strain forward to what lies ahead. Press on in 2024, 25, 26, and as long as the Lord carries to the upward call of God. Hold on to what we have attained. Cling to Jesus Christ, who has made you his own. When we think about what it means to cling to the gospel, we think about how we understand the nature of Christianity. So if you're interested in like re-upping the basics, let's re-up the basics for just a a moment. Uh, I don't really think I am a cynic, and I don't really think I'm a contrarian, but I, there would be enough evidence to lob some accusations. Uh, For instance, I think Taylor Swift is great, but I hate those Stanley Cups. (laughs) Those giant cups that these people are buying today. Like Holly has the seven of them, and like every time I'm driving, their Stanley Cup is like right in the the thing here, and I'm literally going to wreck because I can't move my arm because this giant working man's cup for young women is now <laughs> uh, is now right here, and so I I just don't like these things. So I just look at them and I just I get frustrated. But like I said, I'm not a total contrarian because I can just listen to Taylor Swift and uh, enjoy it, right? Uh, so sometimes trends pop up and. Christian subculture, and I think they're healthy, and sometimes they pop up and they absolutely just make me want to write 100 blogs about them. I do resist that temptation, though. It was trendy several years ago to talk about how Christianity is not a religion, but it's a relationship. Now, maybe that's helpful if you think of Christianity as a sort of stale, dull, lifeless venture, but it is unhelpfully reductionistic. I mean, Christianity makes claims about the world, about humanity, uh, about reality, and it makes claims on us. Christianity is a religion. There is doctrinal and dogmatic content that we don't know that we should go to the Bible and learn. (laughs) It's not just like, oh, like, well, see, Christianity is really just this thing where it's like, God wants to know you, and like, there's no content or like objective truths, just like feel God, know God. No, 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 no. Christianity is a relationship with God, but, but we can't say it's not a religion. It has doctrinal and dogmatic content. and makes claims about reality, about the world. Christianity then is uh, certainly a religion. Christianity is a relationship. Okay, sure, sure. We should know God and love God because God knows us and loves us. So Christianity is a relationship. Sure. Christianity is a religion. Yeah, of of course it is, sure. But let's keep going even further. Christianity is a relationship. Christianity is a religion. But Christianity is good news. Okay, it's not simply doctrine and dogma, though it contains doctrine and dogma. It is news about someone and something. Christianity at its heart is the good news of Jesus Christ. It goes into the world not first as a command but as a proclamation. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, said John the Baptist at the outset of Jesus' public ministry. These first words point to the last words from Jesus himself in his public ministry. There on a Roman cross outside the city gates, as Jesus was dying a criminal's death, he cried out in anguish, it is finished. It's over. He did it. The mission was fulfilled. He took the sins of the world upon himself. The righteous demands of the law were satisfied. He broke the curse of sin and shame. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He accomplished that which only he could accomplish, that which he came to do. He died in the place of sinners, and there on the cross, Jesus did not say, it's just getting started. He said, it is finished. 
The price has been paid in full. Redemption has been wrought. The mission has happened. It's over. He did it. This Jesus who died would rise to verify that which his death had accomplished. He is not here for he has risen as he said, the angel told the women at the tomb. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the content of Christianity that resounds through the ages. Jesus, son of God and son of man, lived, died, and rose from the dead. So go was the command. To every nation, tribe, and tongue, tell them this great message. Tell them what has happened. Oh, there's a famous quote that uh, gets tossed around in sermons all the time that says, the early church, which, as one who studies it, we can idealize. As we're studying through Corinthians, maybe we're reminded that we shouldn't idealize the early church, but nonetheless, they've got a lot of things right that we got wrong, and maybe vice versa. The early church didn't say, look what the world is coming to, but the early church said, look what's come into the world. This message has gone forward that the Lord Jesus Christ has come, he's lived, he's died. Go was the command to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and tongue and tell them what Jesus has accomplished for them. Tell them that it is finished. That at the cross of Calvary, the Lord has vanquished sin and death. And he freely gives his life and righteousness to all who come to him by faith. So Christianity is fundamentally news. It's fundamentally a proclamation. The gospel is good news of what God has done for you and for me. It is the message of Jesus Christ in whom all the promises of God find their yes. Jesus the Christ, God with us and God for us. Any straining forward has to be at the same time a holding fast to Jesus Christ. If you lose sight of this reality, that Christianity is good news of what God has done, then you will be in great spiritual danger. Mike, you can come on up, I am finished. And if Mike's ever not paying attention, we're gonna have a real tough time there. But Mike would never not pay attention. If Christianity is just a religion, then you're free to pick any of them. <laughs> Honestly. Because the ethical commands are similar in so many religions. I mean, love other people, do good things in the world, help the poor, be faithful to your word. There are so many precepts and so many commands that are simple. And so if you think, well, Christianity is just a religion in a world full of religions, and so I just gotta pick the one that's easiest to pick or the most fulfilling to me, and I'm gonna go with it. If Christianity is just a religion, then you might be tempted to, to pick a different one, or, or, or you'll inevitably, if you stick to this one, begin to feel like you're just going through the motions. Oh, it's just this religion, like I go to this place on Sundays, I, like, I try not to say these words, uh, I try to do these things, and I just kinda repeat, you know, lather, rinse, repeat, whatever. But if, if Christianity is just a relationship, then I actually think that uh, this could induce a, a degree of guilt in us because we can then be, um, and this might be a novel insight, like it was helpful for me in preparation. It can like, we can feel like we're the problem in the relationship all the time so we can always subtly approach God like I've let him down. Like if, like, it's a relationship, so be good in your relationship. Like that's the same demand as the religion places on us. Because in my relationships, like I let people down. I, like, I let my wife down. I let my parents down. I let my daughter down. I mean, she, maybe she can't stand me right now. She's in this thing. She's 21 months old, so don't get too nervous. But, uh, I let people down. I just do. And you know, when you let someone down, there's that like, awkward distance between you and them for a little bit until you kind of get past it, whatever it is. And I think sometimes when we think of Christianity, like, okay, it's not about rules, it's about relationships, but I am failing God at every turn. I think if you're not careful, if you forget that Christianity, before it's a religion, before it's a relationship, is good news, then even that correction, that overcorrection, can lead to guilt 
and shame. And you can begin to think of your self-worth in relationship to your own effort in the relationship with God. So the gospel is good news of great joy for you and me. The same God you will one day behold in glory calls you to himself today. We press on. We push forward. We strain ahead. We embrace the difficulty of the spiritual life, not because we've made it our own. We confess with the apostle, I have not made this my own. I haven't attained my goal. I am not perfect, but I press on. Not because I'm the best rule keeper and not because I'm the best relationship partner, but I press on because I belong body and soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. I press on because the Lord Jesus Christ has made me his own. I had sort of a, a, I was going down one rabbit trail for the sermon this week and like as I was going on that rabbit trail, like I found a squirrel and so I chased it down its trail and it led here. Like I was gonna focus more on like rhythms of like uh, redeeming self-care, like biblical self-care. Uh, and I still think that's important and will get preached at some point. But I just really had this overwhelming sense that, that the most important thing we could do this morning is to reflect together on the good news of Jesus for us. And here at the end of the sermon, the, one of the most pointed invitations I can give you, one of the most pointed challenges I can give you for the year is to enjoy him. Enjoy Jesus today. Enjoy Jesus tomorrow. And enjoy Jesus forever. Taste and see that he is good. He is better than anything and everything the world has to offer. He is better than our jobs. He is better than our career goals. He is better than our financial success. He is better even than our health. He is better than our wildest dreams. He is better still than our dearest loved ones, our families, our homes. He is better than our desires. He is better than anything we've ever dared dream. And Jesus is not just waiting for you at the finish line, but he is driving the car that you're sitting in. To use our metaphor earlier, which of course has an end, uh, but we can go a little further down that road. Jesus is not just waiting for you in West Virginia, but he is with you in the rest areas of Withful, Virginia. Like, I am willing to sacrifice, suffer, and struggle because Jesus is with me right now. I am able to say no to lesser things because I'm saying no to a greater thing right now. Like I can strain and persevere towards the ultimate goal because the God who awaits me in glory is on the journey with me. Like he tells me that I'll make it when I don't think I will. And not because of my goodness or my strength, but because he will get me there. He reminds me who I am when I forget. He points me to the cross when I look at all I've done wrong and said wrong and thought wrong and loved wrong. When I'm tempted by guilt and shame, he lifts my eyes to Calvary and he whispers in our ears, it is finished. So, wherever you are, are and whatever your resolutions are for the year of our Lord 2024 this morning's invitation is simple let the past be the past strain forward for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus look for examples of people who are walking this way the church is meant to give us such examples 
So look for examples, but if anyone's going to find them, we also must be them. Be people who say no to sin, who say no to the things of the world because we're saying yes to Jesus and yes to the things of God. Strain forward. Straining is a difficult word. Choose intentionally the things of God. Strain for the upward call of God. Let the past be the past. Strain ahead to the ultimate prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And finally, friends, hold on to Jesus because he holds on to you. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, just selfish creatures. (laughs) We tend to... um, Think about ourselves a lot, our goals, our desires. Um, And so, Lord, I just pray for a moment that right now your spirit would um, just take our eyes off ourselves for a moment and just lift them to heaven, that we would catch a glimpse of where we're going and that the beauty and glory of that vision will drive us forward. That we would not just move ahead in life, but that we would move like out and up. That we would be of any earthly good simply because we are so heavenly minded. Help us, Lord, throughout the year, consider all the imminent implications of our faith. But Lord, don't let us lose this transcendent vision of your glory. Remind us that like, this is where we're going and, and this is the prize. You are the prize, but you have also come to meet us on the journey. So, Lord, remind us that you're with us. Remind us that you love us. Shape our hearts, shape our desires, shape our minds, and shape our thoughts. Shape our bodies and our actions that we may be useful for your kingdom. Use us, Lord, to take this proclamation of the Christian faith that it is finished, that the Lord Jesus Christ has lived, died, and risen for the sake of sinners. May this message be on our lips. May this message move our feet until the whole world hears. Fill us this morning, God, with hopeful anticipation that you are using every bit of us for you. Thank you, Lord, for making us yours. While we were yet a long way off, you've brought us into your family. In your name we pray, amen.